Officers are cutting people out of thousands of pounds by pretending to be the police. We tell you the four things real officers will never ask you for, including your pin. Also, after finding out that my dad's prostate cancer is now incurable, I'll share why it is so important to make memories with the ones you love. And star of Call the Midwife, Helen George, takes us back to the 1950s and she gives us a sneak peek of this year's Christmas special. Welcome to Morning Live with me and Kim. And you haven't come alone this morning, have you? No, I have not. It's bring you parents to work today. <laughs> no one told me. <laughs> no one told you. There they are, look. Oh, hi. Hi, yeah. Pauline. Morning, Dave. <laughs> I'm a cup hi. of tea. It's nice to see them. Ever, we've been following Dave's journey, uh, yeah. haven't we, over the what past few months? Yeah, Almost absolutely. Yeah, I've been following his journey. You know, it's been uh, it's been wonderful. All the kind of lovely messages of support and and everything from morning live viewers. But um, but now we're kind of talking about making memories, and and uh, we're going to make sure that we make many of those. Mm. So uh, so yeah. So uh, but thank you to everybody anyway for all their continued support. Diagnosed with prostate cancer, is it almost three years ago uh, now? Yeah, almost, yeah. almost, almost yeah. 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 And I know one of the big messages is, is to make sure you get checked. That's something he's very passionate about doing. He's... We'll chat to Dave. Yeah, very much a bit so. Later on. Yeah. Uh, and also to Oscar about prostate cancer and the checks we should be doing. Uh, Rav's with us this morning as well, Yvonne Cobb, our chef, and our interpreter, Hayley. Morning, gang. Nice to see you all. Morning. Morning. Lovely to see you. Rav, you're going to be warning us about how fraudsters <coughs> are actually pretending to be police officers over the phone. And you're going to warn us about that in just a moment. But there's also some promising news this morning, isn't there, about a world-first initiative to help combat online scams here in the UK. Yeah, exactly that, a world's first, the online fraud charter. It's going to have 11 uh, of the major tech companies come together, hosted by our Home Secretary, James Cleverly, to sign a pledge in order to combat the massive issue that we've got with online scams, romance fraud, uh, fake adverts, you know, huge problems that we've got. These companies include eBay, Google, Microsoft, LinkedIn, Facebook, you know, lots of places where scams can take place and they're going to come together to try and do something about it. I think it's a really positive yeah. step. Clamping down the scammers yeah. and all the weird terms we have for scams. There's so many of It's really odd, isn't it? Uh, also coming up, we're talking about the health headlines with uh, Oscar. Uh, I was wondering why he's got popcorn. We'll find out in a second. <laughs> uh, but lots of people will be following the COVID inquiry later today when former health secretary Matt Hancock will be given evidence and facing key questions about the UK's response to the pandemic. You can get updates on that across the BBC News Channel starting at 10 a.m. Uh, this morning. So, Oscar, health headlines, popcorn, what's going on? Popcorn. Well, the question today with the popcorn is, does a trip to the cinema or snuggling up with your favourite box set and popcorn, that whole grain, help reduce your risk of dementia? Wow. Also, some news about the first case of a strain of swine flu, which we're seeing here in the UK. And listening to your favourite tune, could it act as a painkiller. Wow. So Are questions. they true, though? So yeah. many questions. We'll he find holds out. All, holds all the answers, Oscar. <laughs> and it's also St Andrew's Day today. So, Yvonne, you have got the perfect treat, haven't you, with a Scottish nod for us? I have. That's absolutely right. I'm making Scottish shortbread biscuits, which are really cheap to make, and they're really Christmassy, a lovely cheap Christmas present as well. So we're really excited about this. Yeah, we're excited as well. Let's take a look at that. Mm -hmm. So that's the shortbread with a posset. Ooh. Which all looks beautiful, but I know Dave for a fact. He'll, he'll have the shortbread, <laughs> but we all know what Dave wants with the shortbread, don't we? Ice fact, cream. I'm surprised he's not started to look around for an ice cream. <laughs> you found any yet? No, I can't find the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> have you tried the freezer, Dave? Oh, that's a good idea. No thoughts of that. <laughs> it's so lovely to have him. He's going to love this as well because his daughter features in uh, Strictly Fitness today. We're doing musicals. That's the theme for the week. Maria will be here with Strictly Fitness a bit later on. Here's the move. Do you want to talk us Here's through it? Move. Do you remember yes. this? This was my cha cha cha. This is actually the week I went out. We're doing this body roll here. I've actually got those knickers for you to wear uh, again <laughs> during, <laughs> during that. Yeah, so uh, I loved that dance. I loved it. I think uh, I was watching your, your dad and your mum, they were bopping away to that bit. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'll be doing the same later. <laughs>
All that coming up, but first, over the past few weeks, uh, there have been a number of warnings from police forces across the UK about scammers posing as officers in order to trick people into handing over cash. One person, Rav, is this right, lost a massive £63,000 to this type of scam? I'm afraid it is right. Yeah, it happened very recently in Letchworth in Hertfordshire where an elderly lady was coerced into handing over £63,000. Wow. It's horrible. She thought she was speaking to a police officer. She thought she was helping the police, but she lost all her money. It's absolutely horrific. So it's a really important warning that we have to get out there today. The way this works, initially people will often get a call from someone saying they're from somewhere like Visa Security or a bank and they'll say this or the bank's head office and they'll say there's some issues with their account. They'll go through transactions and if the person hasn't made these transactions because they're made up, they will then say you're going to get a further call and that further call will then come from someone claiming to be a police officer and saying there's an investigation that we need to help, we need your help with. And this is where the scam takes place because the police officer, the fake police officer will speak to the people and get them to either transfer their money to another account, which is, of course, straight into the scammer's account, but the people think that they're putting it into a safe account, or they're told to physically go to a bank, draw out money, and either post it or physically hand it over to someone, again, thinking that that's a police officer as part of a, an investigation that they're being told they're helping with. There's lots of ways to do it. I have been following this for the last few weeks on scam interceptors. I've been doing it every single day, intercepting these scams. In fact, just yesterday, we stopped one where a lady had over £2,000 in cash in her house, ready to hand it over because she thought she was talking to to a law enforcement agency. She thought she was doing the right thing. It is happening, and that is why it's warning of the week. I think th these scams are getting more and more convincing, aren't they? How, how can people protect themselves? So, uh, look, there's lots of ways you can do this, but there's lots of things to know that police or, or the National Crime Agency, which is another agency that the scammers are using or claiming to be, will never, ever do. Have a look at this. So, first of all, we know they would never, ever phone you up and ask for a <laughs> PIN or bank details over the phone. It's just simply never going to happen. You get a call from that, someone claiming they're a police officer asking you to do that, it is a scam. Put down the phone. They will never ask you to withdraw cash and hand it over to them for safekeeping. It's never going to happen. They they are never, ever going to ask you to transfer money out of your account and send it to somewhere like a safe account because, again, it is a complete scam if you're asked to do that. Um, and they're never going to ask someone to come to your home to physically collect cash. Again, if someone comes there, it is a fraud, it is a scam, <coughs> it is not for you. Shut the door, phone the police. I can see this really winds you up, Rav, because obviously the scammers use all kinds of different tactics. How yeah. then can we make sure we know it's a real police officer? How do we verify yeah. that? And I think it's a really, really good question and it's easy to do. So if you think you're speaking to a police officer or you want to just check you're speaking to a police officer, you can phone your local police by 101. You can do that, you can do an identity check. So just get the person on the phone to give them, to give you your their name, their identification number and the station that they're attached to. You can do a check to find out what their identity is if they are in fact a real person. A genuine police officer will not mind you doing that. No. Water. They'll encourage you to do that. Uh, if it's a National Crime Agency officer that they're claiming to be, then it's slightly different. But again, National Crime Agency officers want you to verify their identity. It's slightly different, but we've put all the details on the Morning Live website Has how you do that. There's a, a website for them there and also a phone number, but it's on our website. But it's worth checking out and it's easy to do if you've got any doubts whatsoever. But as we say, they are never going to ask you to transfer money or reveal banking details over the phone. It's just not going to happen. So if you have handed over your cash or, or your bank details to someone that you think is pretending to be mm -hmm. a police officer, what should you do then? OK, it's really, really important. And, of course, it doesn't, doesn't have to be just you. This could be a family friend or a neighbour or, or someone who's quite vulnerable who may have done this. If you find out, you can help them as well. So you need to phone the police if you think they've physically handed over any cash. Again, 101 is the best number for that. Now, if someone's physically coming to your door and you don't think they're a police officer, you can shut the door and phone 999. That's an emergency if you think someone's coming to take money from you. That is an emergency there. And also to speak to your bank. Tell them what's happened and please be honest with what's happened. So many people feel shame in this. So many people are mm. embarrassed. You must tell the bank how you were tricked, how you thought they were police, how you were coerced into handing over money. And then the bank should, if you've been tricked into that, help you get that money back. Now, if they don't, and some people find that difficult, you can push back and go to the financial ombudsman and raise a complaint with there. And lots of people have done that recently with great success in getting their money back.
Let's get the website uh, back up there because this is so easy uh, to fall for, isn't it? And it's a really, really important yeah. message. So there it is, bbc.co.uk slash morning live. Thanks, Rav. Thank you. Lovely stuff. Well, from fake offices then to fake headlines when it comes to <coughs> health, OSC, you've got some very interesting ones for us today. The question is, are they true or false? Should we start, should we start with swine flu then? Let's start with uh, this headline. UK detects first human case of new swine flu strain. What have you got to say about this one? Well, you'll remember swine flu from that pandemic back in 2009. That yeah. was the H1N1 strain. This is a new strain for the UK, H1N2. And it has been around for a while. So since 2005, there have only been 50 cases of this strain in the entire world reported in humans. So that's really, really not very many. This first one was found in North Yorkshire in somebody who went to their GP just with normal flu-like symptoms, cough, cold, runny nose, slightly sore throat. They didn't require any particular treatments, just self-care, over-the-counter medications, those sorts of things, and we're told that they've made a, a full recovery. So the UK Health Security Agency are keeping an eye on this new strain. At the moment, there doesn't seem to be anything huge to worry about. They don't seem to know where it's come from. We can look at the genetics now to see if it's related to any of the ones in any of the other countries. It doesn't seem to be at the moment. Um, so where it's come from, we don't know, but nothing huge to worry about at the moment. OK, well, next up, this this would actually be amazing if mm. this is true. Um, adding a bag of, pop, bag of popcorn to your daily diet may reduce the risk of dementia. I'm afraid I think there is more hot air in this headline than in my whole bucket of popcorn oh. right here. Which, by the way, Rav's almost finished. <laughs> that, was, that was a proper mound on that at the top of the show. <laughs> it, it was hot earlier. It was hot earlier. Yeah. <laughs> this has been a study in the States, and they've looked at 3,300 people, so good amounts of people, uh, over a six-year period, average age of about 75 wanted to find out the impact of whole grain on your mind and whether it might reduce your risk of getting dementia. So looked at all of those people. Did they eat whole grains, popcorn, quinoa, um, cereals with whole grains? In? They found that if you had more than three portions a day, then you had a significantly reduced risk of developing dementia over that time. But, there's a big but. Firstly, there were not very many different ethnic groups re um, represented in the, in the proportions in the study, so that that's a big problem when you want to extrapolate it and spread it to looking at, at the world in general. Um, there were major problems, though, in the fact that this is what we call an observational study. So those studies can show an association, but they don't show a cause. So popcorn eating doesn't equal reduction in dementia. And then there are the real-life problems. We all know when you have to self-report what you're eating, which they did in this study, who hasn't told a cheeky lie about whether they had a snack or not along the way? And, and you know, if you're asking Geth for our next cinema date, uh, <laughs> I like a sweet and salt combo mix. <laughs> um, and what goes on to popcorn? Well, very few of us are having plain popcorn. You've got your salt, your caramel, your butter, your sugar. All of those things can increase your risk of diabetes, high blood pressure, which in turn can increase your risk of dementia. So I'm afraid the, supermar the um, cinema kiosk rather, is not going to be the place to solve that. That's the, oh. thing you see the well, that's the thing, you see the headline, you have hope, and then you get to the small print and it just ain't true. You've got to be <laughs> careful, haven't you? This is why we do it, Osk. Uh, what about this one then? Um, why listening to your favourite tunes is as good <laughs> as a painkiller. I, I, I can see this a little bit. It changes your mood, doesn't it? Yeah, I think, you know, if you can listen to a tune and then retune the nerve pathways in your brain, that would be really, really helpful. We've known, of course, that listening to music is really helpful for things like anxiety and actually pain in the past, but does your favourite tune make a difference? Well, a small study, 63 people, what they did was they got a heat, sort of a heat wand. Imagine a bit like not very hot straighteners, put it onto people's forearms. So they said it's like having a a hot cup of coffee put against your arm so not that comfortable listening to their favorite musical track and did it make a difference if it was just music that was selected by the investigators well they found that there was a significant reduction in pain if you're listening to your favorite track some problems with limitations with the study definitely um, it depended more on what sort of music you're listening to so moving or bittersweet not popcorn, music, as they describe it, the sort that gives you chills was more effective than other types of music. Oh. So, worth a try. If you're popping to the dentist or something painful, why not give it a go? It's not going to do any harm. Sounds really mean. I, I was just <laughs> going to say, I want to know who agreed to be part of that study. <laughs> don't don't hit your forearms. Don't try this at home, <laughs> <laughs> One of those. Don't, no, no, no straighteners. <laughs>
Uh, happy, but finish your popcorn. You've, Thank you. Come on there. Delicious. Brav. Yeah. Uh, we're going to stay with health now, actually, and looking at the personal impact of receiving a terminal diagnosis. And the reason we're doing that is because we've been following your dad's story, haven't we, for, yeah. for a long time now on Morning Live. Yeah, indeed, yeah. Obviously, dad was diagnosed with um, prostate cancer, incurable cancer, which is now in his bones, and that was uh, about three years ago now. Mm. So i um, been following his journey. But, um, yeah, we're, we're now all about making memories with, with dad, so... Yeah. And this time, the morning live cameras yeah. followed you. My dad Dave was diagnosed with prostate cancer just over three years ago. It was a huge shock for our family. For lots of morning live viewers who have watched my dad right from the beginning of his diagnosis and have been very kind and been, in, you know, uh, following his story, uh, where we're at now, I mean, dad is very frail now. Dad's been bravely living with terminal cancer, which has now spread into his bones. The one amazing thing about my dad is that even now, as sick as he is, he still wants to do as much as he can to help other people. He wants to be able to say, don't leave it. You know, if there's something not right, just go and get checked. Prostate cancer is common, and sadly, over 12,000 men die from it every year in the UK but it can be treatable with an early diagnosis. Your dads, your brothers, your uncles, your sons, please just, you know, get that message across because I wouldn't want to see anyone else go through this. Sorry. <laughs> I'm, 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 I get more emotional than my dad does. He's so strong, it's, it's unbelievable. We know that we've come to that point where they can't do anything else for him. And they actually said, you know, go and make some memories with your family. And that's very much what we're doing. My dad loves music and was in a band in the 1960s. So today we're taking dad to Liverpool for a special family day out to the world famous Cavern Club, where his band played many times on the same stage as the Beatles. Wow, Dave. This has changed yeah. since you were here last. Oh, yeah. How does it feel? Strange, yeah. Does it take you right back? Oh, yeah. Dad's band may not have become the next big thing, but their musical legacy lives on. OK, so time to find my dad's brick. It's amazing that each one of these bricks represents an artist or a band that played at the cavern over the years, and there's so many of them. Oh, it's there, it's there, it's there, it's there. The dominant four. He inspired me to become a performer and his love of music has been shared with all the generations of our family, including my daughter, Emily, who's also a singer. My dad always spoke very fondly about the cavern and his times playing here and it's always kind of been talked about within the family. So coming back here today, it's a really nostalgic trip down memory lane for dad. Walking in the cabinet club today is completely different to me walking in the cabinet club 1962, 63. I remember your hairstyle in those days, folded over at the back and the big quiff at the front. And it was wavy, but it's waved goodbye now, wasn't it, love? <laughs> today is even more special for my dad as my daughter Emily is singing on stage at the cavern, just like he did almost 60 years ago. I think for him today to watch her on that stage is going to be something that he will treasure. It's right now with Dad, it's all about making memories. What was the atmosphere like? Oh, though, the Dad? atmosphere is fabulous. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Really, really good. Best venue around this was. Yeah. yeah. Did you like ever think you'd see Emily singing on the stage at the Cavern? When I was singing and playing guitar at the Cavern, I never even thought I would ever even have a granddaughter. Alone. <laughs> I've just done a sound check here, Grandad. I was nervous, never mind what you must have been like when it's packed. It's empty now. <laughs> How was it? We come here with it. Oh, we've got a gig at the, at the cavern. You know, we're going to court with that and all the people there. Yes, it's nerve wracking. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you're anything like me. As soon as you start, you're all oh, right yeah, there, yeah, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what that was yeah. to say. It's a special kind of nervousness, if you like. So what's it going to feel I, like when you watch it? I'm going to be very proud. You came into my world and life was born And you 
I didn't realise that she could sing as, as well as she does. Or well, she gets it off from me. <laughs> Come there. I found it, and you found it really emotional watching oh, her I sing did, today. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah, I did have a little tearful moment. I mean, I'm so proud of him. He was quite emotional, my dad, throughout her performance, really. Coming on stage, I was overwhelmed with emotion. It was just lovely to just have my granddad just sat watching me because, you know, you never know if he can do that again because, you know, you would take one day at a time at the minute with him. But yeah, it means so much that he was here to watch. This is a memory that none of us will ever forget. We hope by sharing our experiences as a family that Dad can inspire other men to speak to their doctors early if they're concerned about the possible symptoms of prostate cancer. Not wanting to bother people, feeling embarrassed or whatever that is. Honestly, for, for what could be five minutes of embarrassment could save someone's life. People don't talk about it though, do they? No. It's like a taboo subject. What I would like to say to any man out there who has any doubt that they might have something wrong with them, just don't doubt it. Just go and get it checked. And you showed me how alone, like I've never done before. <laughs> what a lovely day. I know, it was yeah. gorgeous. Look. Again. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a really wonderful day. We had such a, a lovely time and brought back lots of memories for, for you, Dad. Certainly did. And Mum, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was amazing, wasn't it? Yeah. Really good. Yeah, yeah I'm walking in the cavern there. It's great. <laughs> Making more memories today, popping into morning life, stealing my sofa, the cheap seat I call that, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Don't think I have a notice. It's good oh. to see you. How, how's it going? How are you at the moment? Yeah, well, it's, it's daily, you know, one day I'm all right and another day I feel great, you know. Mm. So I <laughs> got that wrong. One day I'm all right, the next day I'm bad, you know. Yeah. And that's the way it is now. And just have to live with it. Well, Emily was saying there, wasn't she? It's day by day at the moment. It really is day by day, yeah. You know, you, you don't know. We, we plan for things and we are trying to plan and make, make as many yeah, memories, aren't we? It's very difficult to it. plan anything, really, at the moment. And also, I'm missing yeah. not driving because I've had to give my car up. So yeah. yeah. That's a big thing, that. Yeah. <laughs> that's really knocked into six. Really it's independence, isn't it? It is. So, so cruel. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Uh, you talk about making memories, you've done, you've done a lot of different things, haven't you? You've got the family together a lot as well, haven't you? Yeah, yeah we have, yeah, because I've got two older brothers and an older sister. Very rare that we get together, but we all, we've oh, all been doing yeah. lots together, and there, there we are. We went back to Triada, Triada Bay, Bay, didn't Bay. we? Triada Bay, yeah. Nice, yeah. We used that to was go lovely. there as kids. Looking but, back and thinking back, you know, to when they were there when they were only little. It was just amazing. You yeah. said you remember your dad walking around with a dinghy on his head and <laughs> oh. all you could see was his feet. <laughs> all you could see was these little spindly <laughs> legs. <laughs> Nothing else, just these legs. And going his down speedos. The <laughs> <laughs> but it is lovely to reminisce. But just, not that, Dave, you've been so passionate about getting the message out yeah. there. Can I just read you something? We've had lots of these messages yeah. come in. Over the past few weeks and months, actually, since we've been following your story, and it's from Joanne, and she says, I just wanted to say a big thank you to Kim and her family. About three years ago, my husband, so about the same time, about three years yeah. ago, my husband Chris and I were watching you talk about prostate cancer on the show. Following the programme, he got a checkup for prostate cancer. He tested positive. Wow. He's had treatment, and I'm pleased to say it's under control at the moment. Thank you so much. Oh. We'll be thinking of you. That's oh, that's, that's, what, we want, that's what we want. That's brilliant. You yeah. 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 Well, that was your sole reason, wasn't it, for wanting to, yeah, to yeah. do this yeah. in the first place? Mm. Yeah. And, and ask, it's, it's getting checked, isn't it? What can you do? Because it's not always easy to, to realise there's something going on with prostate cancer. No, you're right. In fact, it's really difficult because a lot of these symptoms can be can be nothing worrying or they can be prostate cancer. So you've got common symptoms like peeing more, needing to go to the loo more at night time or, or even in the daytime as well. Problems with the flow in your urine, so not being able to pass the urine well or when you've been to the loo, not feeling like you're finished, not feeling like you're fully emptying or seeing blood in your urine, which hopefully most people would think of as, as a bit of a red flag and a, and a worrying sign. Now, lots of these symptoms can just be the prostate getting bigger with age testosterone over time causes the prostate to grow and that can block the flow of your urine a little bit so so it can just be 
nothing too serious, but of course it could be prostate cancer. And often in the early stages, we don't see any symptoms at all. <laughs> so really important, if you're feeling you're getting these symptoms, don't just put it down to ageing, being an old man. Go and get it checked. Go yeah. and speak to your doctor. We can, we can check things easily and look into it for you. Yeah, because a lot of people get embarrassed as well, don't they? It's an yeah, it can be quite embarrassing, can't it? Of can, yeah. I mean, you're the, you know, stripping off and getting checked. And... It's not a nice thing, but it's worth it, really worth it. So important. And we can do a lot with blood tests, and we've got brilliant um, new MRI scans, which are high resolution to look at the prostate. So loads that can yeah. be done to check it. Yeah. So good to see you, Bugs. It's lovely to have you on the show, Dave. Thank you. I'll need my sofa you. back at some point. <laughs> <laughs> hold on. So hold on. Short bread. How's that for a deal? <laughs> okay. I'll just glue myself to it. <laughs> Myself. It probably would as well. Uh, now, today is the start of the United Nations Climate Change Conference, or COP28, which has been held in Dubai in the UAE. It's a chance for governments from around the world to discuss what we can do to help the environment. So we sent Helen Skelton to find out what changes you're making to save the planet. COP starts today in Dubai, the UN Climate Change Conference. Have you noticed climate change affecting your life? Day to day, mainly the weather. The season seems to have shifted. There's more heat waves and like different European countries, even here. The winter is shorter, really. And I believe like hedgehogs are only hibernating from about January, so it's really it's milder. Unfortunately, I used to work in one of those dirty coal-fired power stations, so I do know quite well what affects industry as on the on the, on the climate. I work in a small zoo, and there's been loads of baby pigeons, as an example, that have been hatching late and not surviving because it's been really warm in October, and then it got really cold in November. November. Does it worry you at all what's happening with well, the weather? Well, it concerns the me. The thing that concerns me most is what's happening in the oceans with plastic. We all hear about like ice caps melting and the sea levels rising. People that live in hotter countries, their temperatures are going to rise more and some islands might be submerged in the water. You've got major polluters like India, China and America who don't seem to take it as seriously as we do. I don't know how much we can affect it in this country, being such a small country. It's hard to be green. There's an awful lot of people who can't afford it. They can't even afford their gas bill and electric bill and stuff. It is worrying. I think more for the young ones, the future. Do you think we're doing enough? No, we need to do more. We need to do more. And we have most to involve our children because they're future. There's a report suggesting that climate change is affecting food prices and that's why food prices are going up. Probably being uh, also yeah. heavily driven by the cost of fuel. But it's just something that everybody's going to have to get used to. If you want to save the planet, there's going to be a cost involved. It's a, an impact for everybody, isn't it? So the more that we can do individually and collectively, then surely that's going to help with everything. If I were, if I were a small change, adds up to a big thing. What do you think you could do or what are you hoping to do? Change what car I drive, um, reduce my energy consumption at home. Using sol solar panels for energy. Thinking about walking, thinking about using public transport, it all helps, doesn't it? I'd try and recycle as much as I can. Recycle my soft plastics, reduce the amount of shopping I do, buying clothes. I have a milkman, you know, I'm not buying milk bottles. I'm into composting. I have two wormeries. I just love your energy, you're like, <laughs> yeah, I'm into it, I'm into it. <laughs> Sustainability is where it's at. Thank you. A wormery? I mean, that's just brilliant, isn't it? Doing our bit. Lots of people are aware of what's going on. Hopefully there'll be lots of positive uh, news about climate change over the next few days from COP28. Fingers yep, crossed. So, yeah. Well, we're in the kitchen now with cook Yvonne Cobb. Today is St Andrew's Day, so to celebrate Yvonne, you have been inspired by a Scottish treat. What are we making? Today is St Andrew's Day, so we're making my own shortbread um, which is a Scottish biscuit with the zesty orange posset. Mm. Inspired by Mary Queen of Scots? Yes, yeah, Mary Queen of Scots. Um, she... That's Kim before makeup. Me. That's me this morning. He's <laughs> <laughs> not even lying, it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a lovely painting. Anyway, um, yeah, so she had a cultural exchange with a French pastry chef, and it's been around ever since that exchange. So... Here it is. There's the shortbread. We're the posset. There is um, a rumour that we're going to find some ice cream for Dave to have with this <laughs> shortbread. But see if we can convince him with this then. Where do we start with this, Yvonne? 
So where we start, shortbread is so easy to make and it's a really good um, cheap Christmas present. So Geth and you're going to help grate our butter this morning. Grating the butter really helps <laughs> um, to make the shortbread more light. Mm. And um, yeah, over to you as fast as you can, please. As usual, you've already done some because you don't trust me. <laughs> it looks like cheese, yeah. doesn't it? We always have a backup where you're in. No, listen, be careful because I don't want, no, listen, yeah, don't want any does. of your knuckle in my, <laughs> in my shop. That bread. one. Yeah. yeah. This one. So, <laughs> while yeah. you're doing that, Kim, if you can help me put all of the dry ingredients okay. into the food processor. So, we've got plain flour, corn flour, um, which gives a nice balance. And then the, we also have gluten free. Um, version as well. Caster sugar is a must for this dish. Granulate, granulated sugar just gives too much of a grainy texture. And the secret ingredient is semolina for shortbread. Semolina. That is a must. Um, and as I say, this is the secret ingredient with a little pinch of salt. Perfect. Perfect. Give it a quick blend. There we go. So just a few seconds, that's all that takes. And then Geffen, if you are... Can I just say, you've made me do this just to keep me out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I started doing it, I thought, this is one I'll be here for ages. There you go. It's your grated butter. <laughs> just... <laughs> so grated butter is, is great for this. Now, why semolina? What does the semolina do? Sorry. So semolina... Um, Makes the shortbread more crusty, mm. more crunchy. Um, hope, oh, oh, hang on. Uh -oh. <laughs> there was almost that a kitchen disaster. Hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> All over Raven Oscar. Human shortbread. Phew. <laughs> 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 Amazing. <laughs> Just give it a bit of a blend. Yeah. And a bit of a pulse there. Brilliant. So you don't have to use a food processor. You can mix it by hand at home. Um, but yeah, if if you need a bit of extra help after the food processor, you can use your hand just to mix it all in, mm -hmm. like this. So it should be more crumbly. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Gethin. Crumbly, and then press it down with the sp spatula. Do you have to? With a bit of water. Wow. Bit of water. Yeah. Oh, why is that, Yvonne? Why the water on the spatula? So it just means that the spatula doesn't then stick to the ingredients ah. and it's e easier to flatten down yeah. in the okay. position. And then what we need to do is use our fork to poke holes in. And the reason we use um, that method is to release the air. It also releases some of the mo moisture and just makes it a bit more crispier. Mm -hmm. so this has gone a bit crumbly, but apologies, okay. yeah. And it will be... Brilliant. Once we take it out of the oven, you've got to cut it straight away. And Bad so that's your that's shortbread. Mine. And then moving on to our... Is that shortbread there? So we've got different different types of shortbread too. Yeah, so as you can see here, we've got three different versions. We've got the plain flour version here, the lactose-free version, and then the gluten-free there you version. go, Ram. You're the middle one, are you there? Last That's me, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you can use plant-based butter if um, if you need a, a dairy-free or lactose-free version. Mm -hmm. And they all taste really similar. Um, they were a sellout on my community cafe when I used to oh. run one. Oh, yes. Um, so, yeah, they're great. Mm. So, um, the posset, moving on, mm. is so easy to make. That's Honestly, good. it's ridiculously simple. You like that, Ralph? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I gone too early, great. sorry. So just three <laughs> ingredients for the posset. Mm. Um, double cream, and then we've got a lactose-free version for you, caster sugar, mm -hmm. mm. and with, um, with the posset, the difference from um, a posset to the panna cotta yeah. is that it uses, the panna cotta often uses gelatine, so for this dish, mm -hmm. How much does it cost to make then, roughly? Um, all together, one pound fifty per person. So, yeah. How is it? Oh man, mm. I couldn't wait. How good is it? <laughs> it smells gorgeous. So you can have that. That's a that's a, an alternative mm -hmm. as well for you. Mm. 
Oh, it's all kinds of different lovely. options. Yeah. Lovely. Gorgeous. Yeah, lovely. Has your dad had some? Have you taken, did yeah. you give some did to Dave some as well? To... Is it, oh, oh, yeah. Of course he is. Has he got ice cream? He's got ice cream as well. Digging in. Of course he has. Go on, Cut him just as he's like this. <laughs> this is my one here. Mm. I'm it definitely, is I yours. can't miss yeah. out. So, yeah, you put this on, you, you simmer it out for um, a few That's minutes, fantastic. and then it goes oh, a bit more good. creamy. Lovely. You put it in the fridge, and then it hardens. The citric acid makes the, um, reacts with the fat mm. instead of using gelatine. So, what do we think? Mm. I think that it's, is lovely. Lovely. it's a big success. That, that is beautiful. beautiful. Cheers. Oh, thank you. So I'm finishing gonna off. Continue with this now. <laughs> I'm afraid. Mm. <laughs> He's still having it there. Look. He's having a lovely time. <laughs> He's having the best time. It's all he came for. This <laughs> That's brilliant. Thank you, Yvonne. And you can find Yvonne's recipe right now on the Morning Live website at bbc.co.uk forward slash morning live. Now, if shortbread hasn't got you in the mood for Christmas, how about a serving of the hit TV show called The Midwife, which returns to our screens for a festive special on the big day? And actor Helen George, who plays Trixie Franklin, is back too. At the end of last series, she married Matthew in a grand affair. But will they have the Christmas they dreamed of? And who plays Trixie joins us now. Good morning, Helen. Morning. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Now, listen, Trixie is such a loved character, isn't she, by the fans of Call the Midwife. What is it like playing her? It's, um... <laughs> Gethin, can you see my dog? Is that... I was, is what, that is what that... you're looking for? <laughs> 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 Matthew looking behind me. That's, oh, yeah. um, that's Charlie, my oh. Jack Russell, who's decided he needs a, needs a bit of camera time. Hi, um, Charlie. <laughs> Mid-morning little him. nap. He's, he's, yes, he's having a morning nap. Um, it's been amazing. Look, it's been 13 years of having the privilege to play the same character and also a character that's so well-defined and written and such a strong female character. Um, so it's been a real privilege. And, yeah, I've got... Only, I've had the most amazing experiences over the last 13 years with it. It's so popular, isn't it? We got the BBC uh, listings for Christmas Day uh, this week. A great lineup, and Call the Midwife is such a massive part of that. What can we expect from this year's Christmas Day show? I think it really is probably the most festive Christmas special we've ever done. It's very beautiful. Um, just very, it's like a jewel. It, the lighting is gorgeous. There's lots of snow. It pulls on the heartstrings in the way that we love. We call the midwife, you know, the Christmas cry after your sherry. Yeah. Oh, that's, I mean, so, can I just ask, do you snuggle up with Charlie to watch it on Christmas Day? Or? <laughs> just going to say. That. Well, I'm not very good at watching myself, but I watch oh. it, but then leave the room when I'm on screen because I get sweaty <laughs> palms and can't deal with it. <laughs> yeah, I'm a bit like that you're as well. Like I don't that, like yeah. watching myself. It's weird. It's like you're in, you're floating above your head and watching someone else. It's really <laughs> odd. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you're also reprising, reprising your role as Anna, aren't you, in the musical The King and I? That's in the London's West End uh, in January. How, how are you feeling about that? I'm feeling really, really excited. I did it on tour for five months last year. And then this year I'm coming back onto it and I'm doing a week in Eastbourne before Christmas, a week in Salford after Christmas, and then six weeks at the Dominion, which is just an absolute dream come true. Wow. It's a beautiful theatre and the biggest theatre in the West End. Wow. <laughs> um, how, do, um, how do you do five months in that dress? How much is it, <laughs> I mean, how much does it weigh and who are you hiding? <laughs> Charlie, <laughs> <laughs> he comes along on the stage um, and darks is with me. Um, yeah, it, it was it was a it was a, definitely an experience for me having to sort of train. Sorry, Charlie, Charlie, um, <laughs> <laughs> misbehaving. Um, having to sort of train like an athlete for the show. Really, it's such a big role, and the dresses are so heavy. And she's never off stage. And the joy about this show is that the script is enormous, but the script is beautiful. It's like a play with all the most amazing musical theatre songs you've ever heard. Um, so it's definitely a new world for me. Uh, although I've done theatre before, this is the biggest theatre role that I've done. So it's, um, yeah, I need a lot of protein. It's, it's amazing. You are, for sure, the star of the stage. But quite frankly, Charlie's been the star of today's Morning Live. <laughs> Charlie, stop it. He's busy now. <laughs> yeah, maybe this is a good Charlie. time to say goodbye. Yeah, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>
People are still eating their shortbread, Helen. Um, you can uh, watch uh, Call the Midwife uh, on Christmas Day on BBC One and iPlayer. And Helen is on tour, she said, with The King and I in the West End uh, this January. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Helen. You. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. <sighs> Moving on quickly. Have you finished your shortbread, Rav? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Good, because I've got a question Sorry, for you. Sorry, I don't know where to look. Yes. <laughs> we were talking about scammers pretending to be police yes. officers on the show today. Tactics. What are their tactics? Lots of people asking... What does it look like? Well, there's a few it? things that they do. Have a look at this. We can see these are some of the things that they would do. They, they might give you fake hold music or recorded message to make it sound authentic when you're speaking to them on the phone. They might have claimed to have arrested someone and that because of that arrest, you're needed as part of this investigation. And, of course, they might provide fake uh, crime numbers to you. Again, it's all to give the impression that you're speaking to real police officers or law enforcement agents and you're not. So really watch out for any of those tactics. But if they're coming in on the phone asking you for personal details, bank details or transfer money. It is a fake, it is a fraud, it is a scam. Put down the phone. Hazel has been in touch and said she had a phone call this morning from a very threatening, scary-sounding guy who said he was from the International Fraud Office and that I'd been using my internet illegally. He said I would face charges unless I pressed one and this is when I hung up. Very yep. good. See, Classic scam. Listening. It's another one. Yeah, she'd done the right thing hanging up. Well yeah, done, absolutely. Hazel. Well, it's almost time for Strictly Fitness and we know lots of you joining at home. Well, today we've been sent the evidence. This is Chris. This is great. <laughs> it's brilliant. <laughs> He's great. Grandson Shane shared this video. They call him the dancing granddad. <laughs> it was with Bev Knight as inspiration yesterday. It's great, though. So many people get involved with it, don't yeah, we? That's the thing. And it's time for Strictly Fitness now with uh, Maria. Cue the music. <laughs> hey, Maria. Hello. Hello. Right, Hello. Musicals week, all week. Yes, only two more sleeps still. Strictly musical. No, it's exciting. Week, obviously, yeah, of yes. course. Very up. Uh, Helen George's Street This with the musical, but it's actually Kim's move yes. we're looking at today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> We have our body roll from Kim and Graziano's musicals from their amazing routine dedicated to fame. Brilliant. Tell you what. Brilliant. She, she was yeah. good. You it were was good. excellent. It was excellent. You moaned a lot, but you were great. Right? Yeah, I did moan a lot. Of course, before we go into our strictly move, we have our two exercises of the day. So our hands on the hips, and we're going to lift the knees and to the other side. Now, if you are seated, you can just lift the feet off the floor or or you can just reach for the stars with one arm and the other arm. And for our second one, we're gonna put hands on the hips and we're gonna twist the body, give a good stretch to the lower back. Good, and if you're seated, just like that, just like Gethin. And then for our <laughs> move of the day, we're gonna have a roll to the back with a click, roll to the back with a click. And good, just like Kim. <laughs> That's it. A bit creaky. <laughs> Bit creaky. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not gonna lie. Good. Uh, we've got a full squad doing this today. Uh, yes. I, I think. I think Dave and Polly are gonna have a little go as well. They're in the. Oh, he's finished oh, the show. He's short. standing, he's standing oh, up. He knows. He knows what to do. I'm <laughs> All right. Let's do it. Take it away, Al. With a mid-body workout.